Don't forget, some things must be forgotten. The shadow hunting me. I must hurry. My name is Daniel. I live in London at... at... Uh, Mayfair. What have I done? This is crazy. Don't forget. Don't forget. I must stop him. Focus. My name is... is... I am Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome! I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and today we're going back to 2010 and replaying the cult classic first-person exploration horror game Amnesia The Dark Descent. I say replaying, but for me this is a first play, because I bought this game all these years ago and I couldn't finish it. The game genuinely disturbed me so much I couldn't bring myself to complete it. The constant tension, the oppressive atmosphere, the creeping dread around every corner, Amnesia is a seriously scary game. Now I know, there are going to be people that comment already saying it didn't scare them or how I'm a coward, but I see it like this. Amnesia is designed to disturb, to activate the primal part of my brain focused on fear, so I play it in such a way to give it all the advantages it needs. I played alone, at night, in the dark, with headphones on. And when you give yourself over to the game, when you let your guard down and allow it to do its thing, it is terrifying. So let's discuss the game design, from the mechanical to the thematic, from the Lovecraftian undertones to the physics-based puzzle sections, and then the cultural impact Amnesia had on the world. Because this game changed not only horror game design, it changed YouTube, becoming a major catalyst for the let's play and reaction video genres. So grab your tinderbox, light the lantern, and prepare to cower in the corner like a child as we ask Amnesia The Dark Descent, was it any good? Before we begin our hunt for Alexander of Brennenberg, a huge thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive. More on how you can support at the end. For now, let's begin. Amnesia is a first-person horror adventure game. At the start of the game, you have amnesia, but you find a note written to you by you. You learn your name is Daniel, and your mission, assigned to you by your past self, is to find the inner sanctum of this castle and kill Alexander. You don't explain why. So a relatively simple premise, find a dude and kill him. And while amnesia doesn't have defined levels, because you do have a relatively open sense of freedom to explore the castle, it does have defined sections within it, each with a start point and end point and then a puzzle in the middle. Because at its core, Amnesia is a 3D puzzle game in a horror setting, and that's one of the main reasons it's so damn scary. So let's look at the puzzle element first. Daniel controls normally with basic movement, you can jump and duck, but you can also interact with the world through a physics engine. You can pick up objects like boxes, chairs, rocks, or dismembered limbs, then either place them gently down or throw them across the room. The great part about this system is how many puzzle solutions it's built into. Every mechanic in a well-built game should be designed to, at some point, be relevant to gameplay, and Amnesia does this extremely well. You can jump, which is needed to cross gaps, or climb up slopes. You can duck, which is needed to get under falling debris. You can pick up and move items, which is needed to clear passages. You can throw items, which is needed to break down walls or windows or jam machinery. The physics engine isn't just an afterthought given to players because physics movement is fun, it's a bunch of required gameplay mechanics. The puzzles themselves are actually quite varied. You'll start with simple tasks, like following a trail of red drops, then you'll be collecting chemicals to mix into an acidic compound to clear your path, and then you'll be collecting six pieces of an ancient orb, with each being hidden behind a locked door or inside in a faraway room, and then you'll glue them back together as you attempt to stop Alexander summoning a portal to another dimension. Each section has its own puzzle and then its own items. If you find a crowbar, you'll need it pretty soon. If you find a bucket, you'll use it on the well next to you. And any keys you find will open doors within whatever puzzle section you're in now and then not be used again. Once you've finished a section, you don't need to return to it. It's a relatively linear game. There are exceptions, such as returning to a gripper at the end or using the glass jar to carry a variety of mixtures, and in some of the later puzzles you'll need to activate multiple switches in multiple locations to open a single door, so there is a limited path choice within each puzzle section, but in general Amnesia is very A to B design. So if it's just a puzzle game, why is it scary? 
well, you're not alone in this castle. Unlike some horror games, Amnesia doesn't focus on enemy variety. In fact, there are only two types of enemy in the whole game. The grunts, shambling flayed human-like creatures with clawed hands missing lower jaws, and a huge flap of flayed skin hanging from their face, and the brutes, human-like creatures whose entire head is split open and filled with teeth, while their limbs have metal rods and bars screwed into them. While exploring the castle, if one of these enemies spots you, they'll growl and give chase, and you need to run and hide because you absolutely cannot fight back. Now, some people have mentioned that the physics engine can actually be used as a rudimentary combat mechanic, throwing things at the enemy. And yes, it can, but that's been left in on purpose because it makes the game scarier when you realise how useless this is. In a game with no way to defend yourself, you have to run. But when you can choose to pick up and throw a chair and then realise it does nothing, this highlights how weak you are against these enemies. By letting the player choose to fight back and then letting them see how utterly futile this is, you're allowing the player to experience firsthand how terrifying and unstoppable these enemies are. And you are cementing the fact that hide and wait really is the only viable tactic. Instead of just saying, trust me, you have to hide, you're letting the player fight and then realising, oh, I should hide. If the enemies catch you, they will hit you. You can take two hits from a grunt and only one from a brute. It will kill you in one hit, even from full health. So any encounter is always tense. So you'd think the best thing to do if you spot an enemy is to hide in the shadows and then stare at them until they leave. So you always know where they are and you can track them. Well, no, because if you look at them too much, you'll go insane. Along with health, Amnesia has a sanity mechanic because it's a loosely Lovecraftian horror and every loosely Lovecraftian horror ever legally needs to have a sanity mechanic. If you experience something abnormal, like a door blowing open by itself, or you hear a loud scream, or you catch a glimpse of one of the enemies, you'll lose sanity. And as your sanity drops, strange things begin to happen. Some of them can get quite meta and even break the fourth wall. In-game sanity loss affects visual things like your vision going blurry, or the intensity of light sources fading, or audio effects like sounds becoming a little louder, or scratching of fingernails on stone or wood, insects skittering about. Sometimes you'll see leeches all over the floor that weren't there a moment ago and then disappear moments later, but the meta effects take hold too. You'll start getting input lag on your mouse movements, meaning you'll wildly overshoot corners as you're stumbling around, and eventually you'll see cockroaches crawling over your monitor, not in the actual game. On normal mode, low sanity can't kill you. On hard mode it can, so keeping your sanity high is essential. Plus, if you're playing this late at night like I was, the first time you see a cockroach scurrying across your monitor, you will jump back because it's so jarring and unexpected. And it happens so infrequently that it's always a shock. Amnesia is very reserved with its creepy effects, and this reservation means each use is memorable. The horrific never becomes normalised because it's never used enough to become normal. So how do you keep your sanity high? Well, two ways. The first is solving puzzles. When you finish a section of a puzzle, you'll get a flash of soft light, a heartbeat, and your sanity will refill, returning your vision to normal and removing any hallucination effects you were having. So you're encouraged to solve puzzles quickly. And the other method is to stay in the light. So let's look at the use of lighting. Light is a major mechanic in Amnesia. The opening sections of the game are pretty well lit with grand windows and opulent skylights letting in streaks of glorious sunshine. But as you journey into the lower dungeons, you'll be relying entirely on torches and your own oil-guzzling lantern. Throughout the castle, you'll find tinderboxes, these small white cylinders. They always reminded me of those old plastic cartridges camera film used to come in, and you use these to light the torches and candles. Once a light source is lit, it stays lit forever, so it's up to you how much light you want. But you don't have enough tinderboxes to light everything. There will be sections you need to go through the darkness in, or sections with no unlit torches, and in those cases, you've got your lantern. Holding out the lantern casts localised light, but it uses up oil. You'll find oil refills around the castle in little pots, and sometimes you'll find oil refill stations which can only be used once. So you have the ability to light torches and candles, but not everyone in the castle, and the ability to use your lantern to guide you, but not forever, because you need to conserve fuel. So this mechanic would lend itself to playing quickly. But that's at odds with health, and in this lovely contrast, this juxtaposition of gameplay elements 
is what makes you feel so anxious while playing. You want to stay in the light so your sanity remains high, but staying in the light makes it easier for enemies to see you and you don't want that. You want to light torches and candles with tinderboxes so you're not in the darkness, but doing this will make it easier to be seen by enemies and potentially use a tinderbox which might be better used later, so you don't want to do that either. You want to hold your lantern out so you can see, but the light distance isn't that great and you might walk straight into a monster and your fuel is limited so you don't don't want that either. If you do encounter a monster, you want to look at it to keep track of it, but doing this drains sanity, and that makes the game harder, so you don't want to do that either. Amnesia is a beautiful, horrific blend of mechanics that both help and hinder you at the same time, and you both want and don't want to use them. It's this constant internal struggle of justifying your choices while also knowing you might regret them later, which make playing the game so nerve-wracking. Do you creep around a corner slowly with your lantern held out? knowing you're burning through oil that you might need later, or do you run around the corner knowing there might be something there you haven't checked out before? The don't look at the monster mechanic, specifically, is a stroke of genius. The human imagination is more powerful than any Hollywood special effect, and the scariest thing to each person is specific to that person. What scares you might not scare me, and vice versa, but one of the universal fears we as humans feel is fear of the unknown. Once you understand something, no matter how awful it is, you can begin to comprehend it and rationalise it and become less afraid of it. This is the basis of why Lovecraftian horror is so terrifying. It is literally impossible to understand. By forcing you to look away from the enemies, the game is forcing your mind to imagine how bad they could be. You can hear them, you know they are there, but you can't stare at them long enough to understand them. It keeps them vague, and this, in turn, keeps them terrifying. This is probably what sets Amnesia apart from other horror games. It's not just a horror game, it's a puzzle game which is horrifying to play. Because solving the puzzles means coming to terms with the fact that the game mechanics you need to use may not be beneficial to you at the time. Amnesia isn't so much shock horror as it is creeping unease, a constant state of dread and anxiety. It is the tightness in your chest when you know the evil thing is behind you, and if you don't turn around you're safe, but you need to turn around to progress, so you turn around and it's not there. But that doesn't mean you're safe, it just means it's somewhere else. One of the best ways Amnesia sets itself apart from other horror games is its complete lack of jump scares. The jump scare is the laziest form of shock horror. You drain the sound from a scene, then you have the visuals slowly dull out, then a sudden, loud sound matched up with a dramatic visual shift, such as a new camera angle or a scary thing appearing in the frame. Jump scares are not horror, they are simply overwhelming sensory input which shocks you because you weren't expecting them. While Amnesia does have moments of energy changing, like the music changing to chase music or the lighting going out, they never assault your senses. The musical stings are never loud, the lighting changes never put new stuff in front of you to startle you, and they do it this way on purpose because this holds tension. When an audience is scared, they have built up energy or dramatic tension that they want to release, which means the audience are looking for a defined moment when the energy peaks and can be released. In cheap horror films, this is the jump scare. But ask yourself, what happens after that tension gets released? Normally, you smile, or laugh, or giggle, because it was a build-up moment, a moment of panic and release, and then okay, actually, you're fine. And now you're not under dramatic tension anymore. There's a brilliant video on YouTube called The Problem With Horror Movies Today. I'll link it in the description below. Amnesia builds up the tension, and then it never gives you your release moment, because it knows forcing an audience to exist in that uncomfortable, pent-up state is much more disturbing over the long term. Later in the game, it even meta-references its own design philosophy in a letter. In this note about torture, it states that it's better to inflict pain, then let it subside, then inflict more, then let it reduce, and do this repeatedly without ever reaching the peak or letting the victim die, because that constant state of anguish is more effective than killing them. Speaking about letters, let's touch on the plot. You start with amnesia and you slowly recover your memory as you go. Every time you enter a relevant room, you can have a flashback. The screen goes white and you hear Daniel talking to Alexander. The two of them seem civil, if not friendly. There's a definite power imbalance in Alexander's favour, and then around the castle you'll find these notes. Pages from Daniel's diary. Examining one usually gives you a fully voiced reading of the note, and as you venture deeper in, you begin to piece together the story, which I'm about to spoil, so mute the video if you're still going to play the game. 
Daniel is an explorer and travels to the ancient tomb of Tin Hinan. Inside, he touches a mysterious orb and decides to bring the broken shards of it back to London with him. This attaches a mysterious creature called the Shadow to Daniel, and the Shadow will kill anyone who gets too close to him. During a nightmare, Daniel wakes up and discovers he somehow managed to assemble the orb completely. He visits a doctor to get help with the constant nightmares, and they lead him to Alexander of Brennenburg. Alexander tells Daniel he can help him get rid of the Shadow, but they need to perform a warding ritual to buy some time, and this ritual involves killing an innocent man, so Daniel and Alexander do that. The process to destroy the Shadow is taking longer than expected, so Alexander kidnaps even more people and forces Daniel to kill more of them, and then start torturing them, saying the process of torture will make the ritual even more powerful and keep the Shadow at bay longer. Eventually, Daniel discovers the truth. Alexander isn't human, and is manipulating him to power up the orb which he intends to use as a cat list to open a gateway to his original dimension. Racked with guilt about what he's done and too scared to face the reality of the Shadow alone, Daniel writes himself a letter explaining how he must kill Alexander, and then drinks the amnesia potion that they've been given to prisoners so they can torture them forever. He forgets his past and wakes up in the hallway. So, with the basics covered, let's play the game and then afterwards discuss the profound effect Amnesia had on the YouTube scene. I'll also show you the super secret making of files stored in a hidden folder in the game's download section. The first aspect of gameplay you're told is you don't need to save the game. The game does that for you. You also don't need to worry about anything other than what we can see, and because there's no UI at all, what you can see is quite simply the castle. Amnesia is an exploration event, and it takes care of all the behind-the-scenes stuff for you so you are free to focus on being disturbed. It doesn't want you distracted with a heads-up display of health or oil or ammunition or sanity or a map. In the early part, you're still heavily under the effects of the amnesia potion and you will stumble and fall, with some sections restricting your vision or slowing you down. It takes about 15 minutes before you're able to fully control Daniel the way you want forcing you as a player to understand how powerful this amnesia potion is. This early room is your first experience of unnatural darkness, areas of the game where they have actively stopped ambient light entering, so you need to go and explore yourself. And to really start the double guessing early, they've put a statue of a knight in the room, so you get this human-shaped shadow, which is actually nothing to be scared of, but you don't realise that until you're close. Pressing tab opens the menu overlay. It's simple but practical. Items are stored in the centre squares, your health is shown on the left, represented by the state of your heart, and your sanity shown below that, represented by your brain and the nerves cascading from it. You can also see how many tinder boxes you've got and how much oil is in your lantern. You'll experience your first low sanity moment quite early on, seeing doors blow open and small localised tornadoes inside. You'll then begin to see leeches crawling over the floor. You look back and they'll be gone. Nice little low stakes moment of doubt. The first roadblock to your linear exploration is this red goo suddenly appearing. Touching it hurts you, so you're forced to explore the other paths. The wine cellar needs a key, so the lab is your only choice, and here is a nice touch. When you trigger an event, your camera is gently pulled to it. It's not a full takeover of your viewpoint, it's just a soft nudge to encourage you, hey, look at this. This means you never lose control of Daniel, but you're also not going to miss important set pieces of design. In the lab, you'll find a note explaining how an experiment went wrong and they accidentally created a compound which melts organic matter and all of the base ingredients are stored in the wine cellar. I like this. You're able to pretty easily realise you can recreate the compound and melt the red goo. Amnesia is a game that requires you to read in order to progress. Find the first physics puzzle. A cave-in has blocked your way, but the wall over here is weak, so throw something heavy at it and break your way through. The cool thing is, if you don't realise this and you just repeatedly click on the wall, it will break anyway, so you've always got a way out. Once you find the wine cellar key, you'll be able to access the first zone that makes a lot of players quit, the wine cellar itself. It's a large zone with several smaller rooms surrounding the staircase, and it's down here you will encounter your first enemy. You even get a tooltip saying, when you encounter an enemy, hide. And honestly, getting this tooltip and the apprehension that it brings is as scary as the monster. The first encounter you have with an enemy isn't dramatic, it's subtle and understated, because you just turn around and it's there, in the distance, waiting.
This is probably one of the greatest design choices Amnesia made. The early part of the game hints at the enemy, but it doesn't throw them at you. It's perfectly content to let you squirm and wonder, did that happen? When will it appear? Once you've found the chemicals and made the compound, you'll hear the stairs collapsing, and this is your first jumping physics puzzle. You'll need to stack a box to stand on and jump across the gap. Again, no enemies, nice and simple, for now. But look at this cinematography. You're approaching a doorway, so the whole shot is framed and shrunk down, and there's a single square of light coming from an opening further into the room, so your eyes are drawn there, and as you approach... Amnesia really, really wants you on edge. It wants you thinking there are monsters everywhere, but that's not actually true. Once you get further into the game, you begin to realise how it's programmed. Enemies will despawn once they've frightened you. They don't exist continuously. Let's say you're running down a corridor, you spot a monster coming towards you, so you run back and hide. After two minutes, that monster will despawn. So you're free to leave, and this is by design. If they remained constantly in the game, it would just become a giant game of hide and seek, with death constantly a possibility. But that's not the case. It's about the moment of fear and then continuing. Amnesia doesn't want to kill you, because the game doesn't win when it hunts you down. It wins when it makes you think you're being hunted down. The focus is on encouraging the player to think they are always moments away from death, not actually putting them in danger. Which is good, because if the player does die, that's a tension release moment. That's the horror dissipating. If you die three or four times in one section, you replace the horror with frustration and boredom. Repetition isn't scary. But keeping the player alive for as long as possible and making them think they are constantly surrounded, that's the focus because that's scary. And now the second quit moment for many people, the water monster. You are in a flooded basement, and the puzzle is relatively simple. Pull a lever, open a door, go through the door, but there's something invisible in the water. You can follow its movements via the splashes, and you can distract it by throwing stuff into the water and it will go over to that stuff, but you cannot kill it or stop it. And this is the true horror of amnesia. You have to solve a puzzle with an unseen, unstoppable force working against you. Remember how your imagination is scarier than any graphic? This is proof. It's not a snake or a zombie or a fish. It's just an unknown thing that wants you dead. It can't be known, it can't be understood, it can't be comprehended. You must just learn to deal with it. I solved this by daisy chaining boxes from one side to the other, but even this was nerve wracking because I knew one wrong move would put me in the water and that would mean death. This section contrasts nicely with the next, which is simply a sprint. You have no blocks, no way to stop it, so just run. You can hear it splashing behind you. You can hear it gaining and you've got to open the doors, so run. Amnesia manages to balance the slow creeping dread with adrenaline packed sprints so the tension never becomes boring. It's like a roller coaster. You need the slow clanking climb to contrast the downhill rush. But once you get into a new zone, you don't know if you're safe yet. The tension never stops. This is one of the creepiest bits in the game, and it isn't even meant to be scary. Look at this fountain, with a baby's face on a millipede's body. Can you imagine seeing this in someone's house? You'd leave. You'd stop being friends with that person. Here's another brilliantly designed use of mechanics. We open this closet, then we get a jarring zoom in effect, and we hear a sound, and we assume something in the closet is going to jump at us, but no. Something has broken into the room we've just come from, and we need to hide, so we do the natural thing of climbing inside the closet, but unlike other horror games where you can peek out of the hiding spot to see the thing, in Amnesia you need to just wait and listen. Because you're never completely sure when it's gone, you'll always wait longer than you need to, and this means you're forcing yourself to stay in that moment of fear longer than necessary. And when you do leave, it's always with intense apprehension. Here's the first, and I'd say only true, jump scare in the game. And it's not even that intense. Opening this desk, it's not loud or focused, it's just unexpected. I know watching it back now seems like nothing, but with the amount of tension the game had built up, 
Opening this drawer and having skulls fall out at me with a very slight musical sting legitimately scared me. This got me. It's almost nothing and it got me. And if it got you too on your first playthrough, you know how to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Sometimes you'll be walking along and a nearby door will start to get knocked down. It's simple but effective horror because it reinforces a very important design of amnesia. You never die randomly. You're always given a warning of danger. It's never a case of turning a corner and getting ambushed or opening a closet and having an enemy jump out because those designs are jump scares, not continuous horror. Amnesia always lets you know something bad is about to happen and this puts you into fight or flight mode. And we know fighting is pointless so we start running and if you're panicking you'll often do a dumb thing which is run forwards into the unknown and this is a terrific bit of game design. Making the player run away from the unknown scary thing by making them run headlong into more unknown is such an anxious unforgettable experience because the player wants to run to safety but you're constantly terrified that you're running into more danger and you need to balance the okay they're gone I can stop with they might still be there, I should keep going. The puzzles themselves, while being thematically different, such as find chemicals or find gears or find rods, are all some variation of bring a number of specific items to a place and then progress. And one of the game's weaknesses is sometimes you'll get lost and when that happens, fear turns to frustration. The last thing you want the player feeling is irritated because then the dramatic tension you've worked so hard for is replaced with annoyance. Now this only happened two or three times in my whole playthrough because the game is quite nicely designed, but when you do get lost, or you miss a vital item and you have to backtrack, it can hinder the building of fear and replace it with just being irritated. From the wide open spaces of the wine cellar and the elevator repair halls to the claustrophobic tunnels beneath the dungeon, the tight spaces combined with the soundtrack and the sound effects of scratching hands made me feel I was constantly being followed despite there being nothing there. So let's talk about the music. The soundtrack to Amnesia is perfectly fitted to the game. It's understated, but constantly there, underpinning the feeling of unease. The music isn't memorable in the traditional sense. You won't be listening to the soundtrack later on, because the music in Amnesia exists to enhance the feeling of anxiety created by the visuals. The beats don't always match up, the low drones are interrupted by out-of-place screeches in the distance, and the exploration music halfway through, especially in the underground aqueduct and in the temple, is just hauntingly oppressive. It's a low, haunting drone that you don't notice until you stop playing the game, and then you realise it was there and it was making you feel uncomfortable. While you're being chased, that's when the music kicks up. Not with volume, not with high-pitched ear-piercing wails, but with intensity. The music isn't there to shock you, it's there to hold the horror that's been established in place and it does it very well. Now on to one of the main weaknesses, and this is a design choice you'll see in a lot of the games from the early 2010s. It eventually adds in dead bodies, and they just don't look that good. They haven't aged well. Horror is about creating a growing sense of dread, not in the in-game avatar, but in the player, in the human. And this is done via visual, audio, and meta techniques. The scary things that you see, hear, and then experience as a player outside of the in-game mechanics. Once you put something into the game that the player can fully examine and realize, actually, this isn't real, it breaks the illusion. We as players, 
as consumers of media, are willing to suspend our disbelief right up until you show us something that very obviously isn't real. Then, you kill any tension you've built up. This is actually a general performance theory that I bet you've experienced before. The audience are willing to believe something is real right up until they see something that is so obviously not real. And I don't mean aliens or things sci-fi or fantastical, I mean basic things that you know for a fact aren't correct. If you've ever been fully immersed in a TV show or a film scene and then seen one of the actors take a sip from a cup and your first thought is, that cup is empty because they drank wrong, you've experienced firsthand how easy it is to be pulled away from the illusion. These dead bodies in Amnesia do exactly that. Once you add in a dead body model, you're actually going to make a lot of players laugh, or at least giggle, because it's naked. I know a pile of dead naked bodies is meant to be horrific, but graphics age, and this whole scene has ended up looking less realistic than you thought. Yes, a pile of dead bodies is creepy, but it's also the antithesis of Amnesia's design. For all the hours before, it's been a game about implying but not showing Lovecraftian levels of fear. Now it's gone into full-on gore, and that's not disturbing because it's easy to rationalise, comprehend and understand. You've taken away the unknown, therefore you've taken away the scariest aspect of your game. Here's a contrasting example, showing how less can be more. Eventually you exit a room and you find a torso on the floor that wasn't there before. It's actually one of the monsters that's been chasing you, chopped up. And this implies one thing. Something worse than what you've known is now after you. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't show you, it implies it. And this is scary, because once again, you are scared of something you do not know. Eventually you'll meet Agrippa, the consciousness of an occult writer trapped inside a flayed and chained up body. Creepy concept, almost a shame they put it so broadly on display. You see what I mean when I say imagination is scarier? Yes, this whole scene may have had an initial shock factor, but once you've taken it in, it becomes normal. And you have to return to this person several times in the game so it becomes routine. And if your game makes staring at a chained, bound and tortured guy part of your normal routine, you're going to become desensitised to it very quickly, and therefore they need to up the ante and ramp up the gore to shock you again, which changes it from Lovecraftian horror to shock gore. It does seem, as the game closes in on the final segment, it pushes much more into the show-don't-imply school of design, which is a shame. The opening is so scary because it balances your anxiety really well. To see them step away from creating anxious situations toward gross-out gore really lets it down. This large open room is great. You need to avoid the wandering brutes, but this means not using your lantern, taking away a crucial mechanic. Once again, you're reliant on the ambient light, ramping up the tension in this section. This is also the first time I experienced model popping, which was ironically extremely scary because I was absolutely not expecting it. This enemy just appears right in front of me. Eventually you gather the six segments of the orb, most of them are hidden around torture devices Daniel would have been using in the past. We now use the orb to power down the final room's spinning shield, which looks a lot like the bridge from Event Horizon, and then you confront Alexander. Now you have a choice of three possible endings. Number one, stand and do nothing. Let Alexander open the portal and then leave, and you get killed by the shadow. Number two, the neutral ending. Push over all of the energy generating pylons, disrupt the ritual and trap you both there forever. Or number three, throw Agrippa's severed head into the portal when it opens up and save Agrippa but not Alexander, killing both of you, but then you get saved from the eternal darkness by the immortal Agrippa. This is the good ending and this is what I went for, and once you've sat through the credits you'll get given a small, strange code. And here's the secret. Get all three endings, then arrange the three codes you get in order from worst to best, then go into your amnesia files on your PC. For me that means going into the Steam download folder. You'll see a zipped folder called Super Secret and it's password locked. The password is the three ending codes. And inside, you'll find behind the scenes pictures and making of interviews, a whole host of cool game design stuff. So as a game, it's well designed. It leans very heavily into the Lovecraftian, unknowable eldritch horror angle at the start and focuses on building tension without spending it. 
Amnesia is a game which uses the visual, audio and meta gameplay techniques and all involve mechanics to make you feel like you're never ever safe. It teases the idea of an enemy and then hides it. Then it lets you know you're about to die, but it doesn't kill you. It's this constant horrific buildup of pressure with no release. It's walking that knife edge between being totally safe and being constantly killed. Amnesia is a game that makes you so scared you want to stop playing, but when you do stop playing and you examine why, you realise you're scared of what might happen, not what actually did. But Amnesia's legacy isn't just being a good horror game. It's being an almost genre-defining horror game for the YouTube Let's Play reaction generation. Because of its lack of jump scares and focus on building tension, Amnesia was a great game for budding young YouTubers to make Let's Plays of. Because it isn't gratuitous with the gore, they could make YouTube videos. They could milk the tension for reactions. Then when they learn the level, they could speed run past the monsters. It became a rite of passage on YouTube. Have you finished Amnesia? You can find reactions, compilations, and walkthroughs. I remember Zero Punctuation's review being one of the first Zero Punctuation videos I saw. Amnesia launched YouTube careers. It absolutely dominated the Let's Play genre for weeks. It showed game developers there was a market, not just for this type of slow burn horror game from a player's perspective, but from an audience wanting to watch it perspective. Amnesia became a cult hit, and we've had waves of games trying to emulate its success without truly understanding what made it creepy in the first place. Games like Outlast, The Evil Within, the sequel The Machine for Pigs, Alien Isolation, they're all good games in their own right, but they lack the unknowable horror of early game amnesia. So many horror games now are so excited to show off their expensive enemy models by letting you stare at them or lighting them up or the incredible water physics, or the action-packed gunplay. They forgot what true horror is. It's knowing something unknowable is out there coming for you, and you have no idea when it will strike. It's about using the audience's imagination against them. You don't need to model the creepiest thing ever known. You need to model what could be creepy, and then encourage the audience to fill in the blanks. So, Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Was it any good? It was a fantastic Lovecraftian horror experience focused on oppressive atmosphere and incredible amounts of tension built and never released. It's uncomfortable to play. It's anxiety inducing. It hits all the right terror notes. It does lose its way slightly toward the end by showing a bit too much graphically and not implying as much as the early game. And some of the puzzles can stray into frustration territory and the dead bodies definitely haven't aged well, but in general, it's a very high quality, horrific gameplay experience. So to end the review, I would award Amnesia The Dark Descent managed to make a small pile of bones falling out of a cupboard more tense and scary than all of the evil within. Out of 10. Cheers for watching. Another massive thank you to the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and Discord. And as always, remember... Don't be afraid, Daniel. I can't tell you why, but know this. I choose to forget. Try to find comfort and strength in that fact. There is a purpose. You are my final effort to put things right. God willing, the name Alexander of Brandenburg still invokes bitter anger in you. If not, this will sound horrible. Go to the inner sanctum, find Alexander, and kill him.